Is staying friends with your ex ever a good idea? Well, it's personal. And in this episode, I get personal with my ex-husband, John Curley. We discuss everything exes, and you will know more about some of my back history and why he and I have been able to stay friends, how we did it, and it might help you determine if you want to or could stay friends with your ex. So without further delay, let's get to this episode all about staying friends with your ex. Is it ever a good idea? I'm so thankful for your advice. I love how intelligent and eloquent you are and still have love. You've given me some great guidance and direction and now it's up to me to execute it. I feel a lot better just working through it. I thank you so, so much. I feel like you already are instilling more confidence in me that this is possible. Sick of sacrificing or settling in your romantic life? Welcome to Make Him Wonder with Coach Paula Grooms, where women struggling in real relationships ask the expert. Unscripted, unfiltered, understandable coaching conversations to help passionate women succeed in love. Hi there, and welcome to Make Him Wonder. I'm your host, Coach Paula, a dating and relationship coach for women, licensed social worker, and author of the book, Why Won't He Commit?, how a man decides to make you the one. I coach you to find a potential Mr. Right, get an ex back, or grow an existing relationship with a man you truly desire, and learn how to inspire his continued interest for the relationship of your dreams, so that you level up to the complete commitment you totally deserve. My guest today is quite a special one, who holds a special place in my heart. He is none other than my ex-husband, John Curley, The sometimes lovable, always lively, and mostly good for a laugh radio host of the John Curley and Sherry Show on 97.3 FM in Clee Ellum, Washington. John is also the top charity auctioneer in the United States, raising nearly $100 million for various nonprofits. He calls himself a part-time pumpkin farmer, full-time dog lover, and, currently on his third marriage, He recently bought a wedding venue because he says he wants to be prepared just in case a fourth comes along. How lovely, John. I'm sure Nicole would be so proud. John comes on Make Him Wonder today as he is here in New York City. You can hear that in the background Mm -hmm. for a charity auction. And because as we have navigated a really good ex-relationship, I thought it would be special to talk, share some facts on divorce, and have some fun. Welcome, John. Thank you. Good to see you. Oh, you too. (laughs) (laughs) So, I want to talk today about exes because somehow, and I don't really know how we did it, but we did navigate through a period of not so friendly, Mm. friendly, and then I would say friends. Yes. Is that fair? That is fair. And, And for the thousands and thousands of people that come to you for advice, the thing that they know and I think they like about you, love about you, is that you're very practical. And you, it, was, it was April 29th, we were celebrating our 12th wedding anniversary, we were sharing a cheeseburger at the Nickerson Cafe, and you paused briefly and said, what are we doing? And I said, well, we're, we're having lunch, we're, it's our anniversary, and you said, no, what are we doing? And then you paused and said, you've always wanted to be a father. I've never wanted to be a parent. You haven't changed and I haven't changed, so I will give you a divorce because I don't want you to turn 50 and to resent me. And I pause and I said, but I love you. And you go, oh, I know, and I love you too, but this is best for you. So you gave me a gift that day. Thank you. You're welcome. And you have two beautiful children now? That's right. When they were in their teenage years, um, I wanted to call you and see if if you would um, take responsibility for them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I muddled through. But yeah, that was uh, I, I've told that story once or twice before, and people are, when I tell them that they don't know you, and there was, oh my God, what a strong woman, because we could have kept going, right? But you yeah. saw ahead, and you were like, you're you're going to resent this. You will resent me, and and you gave up you know, the quote-unquote security, you gave up what was going to be just normal path 
for me. You did that for me. And then you even said, I could be gone by Friday. And within a few days, you were gone and back in New York. Um, yeah, it was really something. I mean, I, I think about it often and because the 29th of April is coming up. That's right. It's interesting because it was not altogether altruistic because I also knew if you resent me, A, how am I going to feel about myself? Sure. And we will have a shitty marriage. Right. Right? Right. And, yeah, I really respected you. I also knew, I believe, that we had talked about this going into the marriage, which I recommend for people. Of course, you have to talk about children. Mm. And I knew that on some level that day was going to come. Because you, I think always knew you wanted to right deep down right and I always knew I didn't but I think you acquiesced in the beginning which I believe many men will do because you weren't under any time constraint when we married we married fairly young and you thought well yeah I don't want kids now yeah and men are I talk about this all the time men are on top of time Mm. you didn't want them then right so okay we love each other we're having fun we have a good relationship okay we get married and that's gonna work itself out right yes yes and do you remember at one point you said to me when we were really getting down to the nitty-gritty about the divorce I said why did you ever marry me you knew I didn't want to have children Mm -hmm. and you said after 11 years of knowing me yeah and me not wanting children, you said, everyone wants children. Oh, wow. Whoops. <laughs> yeah, that's what I said. <laughs> wow, yeah. Uh-huh. Do you remember the night we were in a restaurant in New York, in Washington, D.C.? I was doing, as a weatherman there. And I had met someone on the show I was doing, uh, and the woman was involved with the Russian orphanage. And she called me and said, I can get you a baby right now. I do. And we were sitting there, and I, I said, I, I can call her right now. She has a child for us. We can have a baby tomorrow. You remember this? Remember this? And you're like, whoa, whoa, what are you doing? What are you? I said, that's a beautiful baby. We can get this baby from Russia. She can get us this child. We were in that restaurant. I still remember that. And you were like, wait, wait, what? What are you talking about? I haven't even ordered soup yet. <laughs> I'm sure I wasn't that funny. But, but I... I had not remembered that until today. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And what did you feel in that moment? That, like, all of a sudden, it was all happening. That suddenly I would break through and you would go with it. Which I think speaks to, you know, the, the topic that you have today is selective memories, right? I remember certain things, you don't. So when exes get together, there's this puzzle piece that they're putting together blindfolded. They, they take the blindfold off and there it is, but they've got the pieces in their hand. Oh, I see. That fit here and that fit there. So conversations like this, if they can be done, is a beautiful moment to, in hindsight to look back and go, oh, you did that and I did this and then I said this and you said that. And then it gives you clarity, I think, in moving forward into the next relationship that you're in. I totally agree. Yeah. I totally agree. It's unfortunate that many people don't allow for that to transpire and hold on to the negativity Mm. of separation or hurts or what have you. Yes. Because I really, and I might be going out on a limb here, but I don't think anybody goes into marriage saying, I want to hurt this person and get out of this, fall out of love, uh, not go the distance. And why most divorces are brought to divorce attorneys, 80% by women, Mm. is because men will hold on to the responsibility of marriage. And you would have stayed had I not, because you're a good guy. Mm. This is what happens. Men will stay because it's my puppy principle at work, Uh, right? Yeah. 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 That once you take on that responsibility, Mm -hmm. you're going to stay with it no matter how you feel. Yes. Yeah. I think of it like I've explained to people that if you had a house and you wanted to fill certain rooms with furniture or whatever, I just, when 
I was gonna be okay with the fact that I wouldn't be a father. So it was like I took a board, I took boards and I closed down that part of the house. I said, okay, then I'll just have my life over in this part of the house. But that part of the home was always still there, right? And just putting up the plywood doesn't do it. Remember, I, then I got on uh, Zoloft and stuff. So I, because I, I would get on SSRI, serotonin reuptake inhibitors, yeah. because in the back of my mind, I was there was something behind the board that I put up at the house. It was saying, hey, what about being a father? What about being a father? What about, so I got on those drugs to sort of quiet those voices so I could move forward. But you also, here's another selective memory, I don't know if you remember this. You said to me once, hmm. in a very rare moment of anger, because you didn't show any of it, you we might have felt fought. it. We really didn't. No. We really didn't. No, and we went to a therapist and she said, well, that's a, tr that's a problem. You Did should be able to fight. And we never fought. Once you yelled at me and said, why don't you fight? You, why, aren't, why aren't you feeling passionate enough to save this relationship? And I never thought of fighting because I didn't want to lose you. And I always felt like you were doing me a favor by being married to me. So I didn't want to push oh. it. No, no, because like, yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah, I right. get that. You were, yeah. But selective memory going back okay. to you in the, the board analogy, you actually came home one day with a Harley. <laughs> And you said, if I'm not having kids, I'm getting every toy I want. Mm. Yes. And then I drove to Sturgis. Yes! And I got to the Fred's Bar and Go-Go, which should be <laughs> renamed Stretch Marks. And <laughs> these gals dancing their heart out on stage. And I had bought a Snickers bar in Spokane and put the rest of it in my back pocket. It was very hot. It melted in my back pocket. And then this guy goes, hey, shit boy, while I was in the bar. And I, I said, well, is he talking to me? I turned around, you're a shit boy. And then we, you know, we went outside and I got punched in the lip. What? I remember, I cut my lip. He punched you? He hit Why? my hand because I held up a bunch of peanuts and Snickers. You shit your pants, shit boy. And I said, I don't think so. I reached back there and I held up my hand and it had my wedding ring on it. And I said, yeah, I did, I did shit myself. In fact, there's some peanuts. You want some? And he slapped my hand. It came up, hit my lip and cut my lip and put Snickers bar mess all <sighs> over my face. So that's, and then I thought, what am I doing? So I got back on the motorcycle. I came back home. I had the cut lip and then you said, you've got to get your lip fixed. You went to a plastic surgeon. Remember that? And he stitched up my lip. No! Yes! I, I remember the lip, but I don't remember that we went to a plastic surgeon. Okay. Right. So and good we for me. The, and we met the you better guy. thank me for that. Then we met the guy, the plastic surgeon. We're walking down Queen Anne Avenue, and this guy walks up and goes, hey, how you doing? And with that, he grabs my lip. Hey, it's healing pretty well. I said, oh, okay. And walk away. I said, who was that? And you go, that's the guy that fixed your lip. I said, oh. I was wondering why the stranger was grabbing my face <laughs> and my lip. They're like, God, you don't recognize anybody. Yeah. Wow. So I bought the motorcycle. Yeah, because I figured, well, I'm going to live my life. And right. Then, you know, because if you don't have kids, get a motorcycle. And you hated that motorcycle. You well, it was dangerous, you know. Right. You, yeah. And then also, I don't know if you remember this. Then, <laughs> uh -oh. here's what I remember happening. Okay. You went to Ireland. Yes. And if, yes. And if people don't know, John Curley 99% Irish according to 23 and me. There you yeah. go. So, you came home. You're in the kitchen. Yes, I remember this. You do? Mm-hmm. You had an experience there. Yes. I saw all these little Irish kids. I was like, wow, that's... And I, I was visiting the homeland of my grandfather. And I thought, well, this, here we've got these... That's part of the heritage, the tree continuing. And I thought, you know, why should I all of a sudden stop? So I came home and I told you I wanted to have kids and I was sitting in the corner of the kitchen crying. I told you, I want to have a child. I want to have a child. Preferably, a you know, one that doesn't develop a drinking problem by seven. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Irish people. Yeah, and you, what did you say? Well, I'm going to let you go do that. Mm. But then I think I sort of... But no, 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 no. Because it was the choice between I got to lose you or have a kid. Right. Then, like, if you didn't want to have a kid. That's the thing. Women women aren't given. The guy can, like, the woman's like, I want to have a child. The guy's like, oh, okay, fine. 
And then, you know, for him, his life doesn't change very much. And she's now saddled with this kid. And the guy was like, I wasn't into it. It was your idea. So he gives himself a pass all the time. Plays golf on Saturdays, goes out with the guys, is not involved as much with the kid. Hey, it's your kid. You wanted to have him. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't work either. No. And I was working at the time with... They're called dually diagnosed. They have both a mental health diagnosis mm -hmm. and a severe developmental disability. Yeah. So the poor people, they were just wow. so, yes. And my life at the time, I don't know if you know, but here I'm working with the most severely impacted people in our society. And I would be there at work and then I'd come home, throw on a cocktail dress mm. and go to like something with the Gates Foundation, you yeah. know, and you'd be there and... It was, um, it was, yeah, quite the life at the right. time. But to round it out, I and I thank you for doing this today because I, I think it's lovely if it can happen to folks, especially if you have children. Mm. Being at least friendly with your ex yes. is so important. Now, you marry again. You have children now. Yes. And is that happening for you? Um, just as you predicted um, that the marriage ended, it was okay. When, when did I predict that it would end? Here's what you said. No, you said to me, this is where your big prediction was. That you'll be okay. It's when you marry again is when things will go very bad. Uh. And sure enough, I when yeah, I got married again. And then once word got to my ex, then it was very, very cold. Because the sense of, it's okay to be divorced. It's okay to be dating. But then to be replaced, that's the thing that really drives home the other person. Like, oh my God, I've been replaced. And that kind of sealed it, and then and got very, it got very cold for a while. See, I also didn't feel that. I no, was you didn't. very happy for you. Yes. That you found someone that it was going to work with, and that you were going to have kids with. Yes. But she didn't want to be friendly with me. No, not at all. Why? I don't know. It was shocking, and I, I and I hadn't spoken to you in 15 years, and I called you about something, and some she was very threatened by you, but I don't quite understand that. But that's another story. But you, you either said it or somebody smart said it one time, and that that all uh, hurt, uh, jealousy, anger, resentment, all that comes from unrecognized hurt. That if you don't recognize the person's hurt and address that right away, they will continue to fester that hurt and keep that, like picking at a wound, until finally you address it. And until you address it, it will fester and will be there, and it will take over the person's entire relationship with you. So. All negative emotions stem from unrecognized hurt. You go back, how did I hurt you? And you have to address that first before you can move forward. And luckily for us, we never got to that place where all of a sudden we were hurting one another. It would have gone there, for me anyway, right? Right, the, the, the and I knew that. The Harley and this, and then maybe, yes. the cheat, maybe there'd be cheating or something else, because it's like, damn it, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take care of me, because we're not taking care of each other. But we didn't get there, thank God. Right. But that would have happened. Yes. Because there was unrecognized hurt, which is, I want to be a father. Right. But it shouldn't be hurt. It should just be the reality, because you told me, I don't want kids. You told me in the very beginning. So that's not something that somebody comes around to. That's part of your thing of having a relationship, but then having big, deep conversations and laying it out there. I... I'm asked this all the time. Well, what made you know you did not want to have kids? I mean, most people, it's a natural, normal thing to want to have kids. I don't know about that. That probably comes from a herd of mine, mm -hmm. you know, something. But at the time when I was working with the population I yeah. just mentioned, I was working under a fantastic psychiatrist. She was really an interesting, you met her. Yes, yes. Very, very interesting. And uh, she kind of took me under her wing and this was a woman who went through medical school while she had three young children. Mm. She said, you're the only woman I know who's never had children in her life, but you know what it takes to do it properly and rear them properly. And because you don't think you can and you won't do it perfectly, which no one does, that's why you don't want to do it. Yes. And yeah. I said, yes, that's it. Yeah, it's like renting a jet ski on vacation in Mexico. It looks like fun until you get on it. <laughs> and then what happens? Oh, then you're like, exactly. $85? How long do we rent this thing for? Right? Let's bring it back. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, 
I'm so happy you did this today. Oh, good. I, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm glad you're in New York. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, I, I, there is one thing. I, you don't edit it out. But I read your whole book. And the fact that I only appear once on page 181. No, and, page 11. No. Page I, 11. I don't even have 181 pages in the book. It's 131 then. I saw it. I saw it. And it's only mentioned one paragraph. I'm like, really? Really? That's it? That's all I get? It's, like a, it's no big deal now. I mean, let's go to reprint. But the book isn't about I know, me. But you know, so, I know. It's like, not about me. I but I know you're a lovable narcissist. It should be about you, right? <laughs> not a whole bunch. <laughs> <laughs> now, when I brag about you writing a book, my friends are like, oh, are you in it? I said, eh, not really. But that's okay. But I had, in all fairness, I had written it <laughs> years after we oh, were, right? right. Oh, and I had had a whole, whole life. Oh, I'm so glad we got divorced. <laughs> Thank you, John. You're welcome, Paula. It was great meeting up with John to do this episode for you. I hope you enjoyed a little peek into my past life. I'm back in the studio, as you can hear, and some reflections on our discussion. First and foremost, how life, if we are fortunate enough to live past 50, and some of us, it will be many, many years past 50. And that means that we will live many lifetimes. And one thing that occurs, I believe, for people, and this has always been regarding divorce, that you failed in some way when you get a divorce. Understandable the feeling. Certainly I had it when we reframe it, given that our lives are very long, it can be looked at as an accomplishment in a way, if done well, especially if children are involved. What greater thing can two people do together than make other human beings? But so many of us, unfortunately, have been told that divorce should end any kind of relationship with that person. Certainly there are many instances where that is a wise thing to do. For example, an abusive relationship. Many times it simply ends not because love is not present, but because of circumstances, moving, jobs, divergent lives from just living and growing and becoming someone different than when you entered the relationship. I'm not advocating divorce at all. And in the case for John and I, it was a very specific thing that truly necessitated our divorce because there was no compromise. Whenever possible, working towards a compromise is always preferable. But if you are someone dealing with a divorce, break up if you're holding on to it, I hope this can give you a chance to perhaps look at things under a different lens. There's always grief to some degree. However, so when you are able to, through the grace of time and hindsight, reconcile in some fashion vis-a-vis -a, -vis a friendship, and naturally that is going to include to some degree that man's new relationships. For example, for John and I, I and his new wife are friendly and friends as well. As you heard, his second wife, that was not a possibility. So there are factors of other people and relationships that must be dealt with and taken into consideration. I pulled up an article from the Government College of Engineering and leather technology, oddly enough, good article, Divorce and Friendship, How Many Exes Really Stay Friends in 2023? Writer Travis Heath compiled this, The Astonishing Truth Revealed That According to Recent Studies Conducted in the U.S., Approximately 30% of divorced couples are able to maintain a friendly connection post-divorce. 
This statistic challenges the notion that all divorces must result in lifelong feuds and cold-hearted animosity. The factors influencing the possibility of friendship, one, just what I alluded to, new people and partners coming in to the picture, mutual respect must be shown, communication with good boundaries. Mm -hmm. Very important. A new partner or spouse, of course, must be the first priority and deference must be paid to that person. I believe it's very helpful for children to see their parents being respectful, being supportive of each other in whatever way possible, and having a good relationship. So in the cases of divorce with children, whenever possible, the first and foremost priority must be those children. And hopefully, if you are in a situation of divorce with children, your ex-husband is on the same page with you regarding his new partner or wife. A takeaway for you, I hope, is that you understand from this discussion how important your knowledge of the puppy principle is, which is in my book, to understand how men bond, commit, and will stay in a marriage because they feel the right thing to do is to keep to their word and stay responsible and maintain the responsibility they committed to. Again, it is why divorce is brought to the table by women 80% of the time. Here's the rub. And this is in my book as well, and I go into it in depth, why a man will step out of a marriage by cheating and stay. Because to a man, the most important thing to that man is maintaining the responsibility that he took on. This is very difficult for women to understand, and why the puppy principle will help you if you are in a situation like that. Because we understand how we can override our feelings and maintain responsibility even when we don't much feel like it. For example, if we have adopted a puppy that turns into an adult puppy who we really don't feel like taking care of anymore for whatever reason. Our life changes. It's not the most loving, wonderful creature that we hoped it would be, etc. But for most of us, we don't just go and shirk that responsibility that we took on once we take it on. And good men are like that. So via this conversation, I hope you get a glimpse into what I did knowing that if we continued and I got what I wanted out of the relationship, he would not have gotten what he wanted. And if that's the case, it will not bode very well for any kind of good relationship down the road. In other words, it would have ended eventually, probably in an adversarial way rather than the non-adversarial way we did it. As John admitted, he would have been resentful. I knew that. And when a man becomes resentful, he will not shirk the responsibility. He will instead act out. So we thwarted that and were able to maintain civility through the first years. Friend Lee, during his second marriage, but not really friends, out of deference to his second wife and mother of his children, and now are able to be more what we would consider friends. I also pulled up from Psychology Today an article that I thought was very nice, short, quite a bit older, from 2011 by PhD Seth Myers, not to be confused with the SNL Seth Myers, entitled Stay Friends After Divorce, dot dot, why coping and moving on. I liked something he said in it, so I thought I would read that to you. Too often, men and women end relationships and feel that they made a mistake in choosing the partner they committed to in the past 
because the relationship didn't work. But such a perspective betrays the bigger picture that relationships are one of life's greatest classrooms. And it's within this context that we figure out what we need and learn how to move closer to true fulfillment. That says it all. So I will leave you with that today. And unlike my usual ending of reminding you to make him wonder, I will say this. Enjoy every moment. Let go. Forgive with boundaries. And take in all the wonder around you. Love your past by embracing the present and looking ahead to manifest the future you desire and deserve. I trust you got a lot of great information and gained valuable insight from this conversation that you can use to help you in your romantic life. It's why this podcast exists and why there are several episodes that I choose to bring to you in their entirety. But you may not know that 98% of Make Him Wonder episodes are only partially available on YouTube and podcast listening platforms. And because I don't want you to miss out on getting the results you desire, I invite you to check out the 8020 Wonder Club, an exclusive membership-only club of the Make Him Wonder podcast, where you get each episode in its entirety ad-free. Over 150 episodes with a real woman coming to me with a real-life love situation like you just heard, all categorized by age and relationship status. So you can choose episodes that pertain to your unique situation, categories of 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s, getting an ex back, situationships, dating divorced, older women, younger men, and so much more. Plus, all new episodes the moment they're formatted and ready to be aired. No waiting for partial episodes to drop here on YouTube or your podcast listening platform. The 8020 Wonder Club also includes my Making Magic with Men Mindset Manual, a weekly video series of mindset and mechanics practices for you to do at your own pace each and every week. Join the club monthly and cancel at any time or save by committing to a 6 or 12 month membership. And not only will you save by committing to more, you'll receive a full coaching intensive experience where you'll be talking to me personally. You choose the date anytime during your 12 months and I'll be answering all your questions on getting what you want with the man you want. Don't miss out on how to make your man wonder in the right way to have the results you desire and deserve. Go now to the 8020wonder.club that's T H E eight zero two zero wonder dot club. You and your love will be glad you did.